All right, here we are. Rhythm Reading Bootcamp, Season 1, Episode 4. We're going to talk about eighth notes today, the wonderful world of eighth note syncopation. But before we get to that, I know no one likes a sales pitch, but I've got you here, so just bear with me. If you are yet to purchase a copy of Rhythm Reading Bootcamp Volume 1, Rhythmic Fundamentals, hit the link down below to be taken to the free bass transcriptions web store where you can pick up a copy for a very reasonable price, I would say. That book contains everything that we're talking about today, plus a little bit more explanation, plus tons of exercises to get you really confident and accurate with the fundamentals of rhythmic notation, which will not only work wonders for your sight reading, it'll also just improve your general awareness of rhythm. And as we are a rhythm section instrument, I think that's pretty important. You might disagree. Who knows? Anyway, enough of that. Let's get into eighth notes. The eighth note, the gateway to syncopation. In the previous episode, we talked about some basic note values, whole notes, half notes, quarter notes. If we take our quarter note, our basic unit of time, our basic unit of pulse in four full time, and we split that in half, we get two eighth notes, each worth half a beat each. They look similar to quarter notes on the staff, but they have tails. And as eighth notes commonly appear in pairs, if you have two of them next to each other, they are beamed together. That's the technical term for that, beaming. We join them together. And again, that's apparently to make things easier to read. You might find it harder, but it's generally designed so we can look when we're sight reading and see very clearly where the beats in the bar fall. Now, in order to work out how eighth notes fit into our way of counting time, we need a simple, accurate and repeatable system for counting them. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two bars of quarter notes. We're going to play the same thing twice, but the second time we're going to count it slightly differently. Here's what it looks like. In the first bar, I'm just going to count one, two, three, four. But the second time, I'm going to play my quarter notes, but I'm going to count and in between each note. Here we go. I'm going to count myself in. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and. Now, writing and underneath the music is pretty cumbersome, so we just generally use a plus sign. We don't say plus because it's not maths that we're dealing with, thankfully. We just say and, but that's how you notate and if you're annotating a piece of music. So if I take my bar of quarter notes and I introduce a pair of eighth notes on beat one, it's going to look like this. And we can now play that really easily because all that we have to do is whenever we see an eighth note, we're just going to say and if it falls in between the beats. And that will give us that rhythm of two equally spaced notes falling in the space of one beat. So here we go. One, two, three, four. So one and two and three and four and. If you're the sort of person that likes to tap your foot when you play, and there's nothing wrong with that, up to a point, every time your foot hits the floor, that's going to be the downbeat, the one, two, the three, or the four. Every time your foot comes off the floor to its highest point, that's going to be the and. So it's very easy to feel it as well in a sort of kinesthetic sense if you're someone that likes to do that. We can even revert to clapping the exercise while tapping your foot. So if I do that, one, two, three, four. So one and two, three, four. It would sound like that. Now you notice in that example, I didn't count out all the ands. I didn't count out every eighth note subdivision. And that's because you run out of breath very quickly, or at least I do. So in order to save your breath and make life easier, you only have to count the smallest subdivision that's present on that beat. So if there aren't any eighth notes, don't count them. Just count quarter notes. So let's take that bar again. We'll play it, but we'll make our lives easier by only counting the eighth notes when they're present. Here we go. One, two, three, four. One and two, three, four. Much better, right? Much, much more straightforward. So if we take our pair of eighth notes on beat one and we start moving that thing through the bar, so put them on beat two, beat three, beat four, we get really good at playing through all the available combinations of three quarter notes and a pair of eighth notes in a bar of four, four. So let's try that right now. We're going to do it to a click just to make sure that we're being really accurate. Here we go. One, two, three, four. So 
So some sharp-eared viewers will have noticed that I'm not accenting beat one with the metronome. All my clicks are equal, and that's deliberate because I don't want to have any sort of uh, time or rhythmic crutch when I'm practicing. A lot of my students do this when I have to shout at them. They practice with a click that accents beat one. And as we get further into the murky waters of eighth note syncopation, they run into trouble because they have no implicit internal sense of where beat one is because their metronome has been helping them out the whole time. And I think it's really important to get rid of that as soon as possible and just develop your own internal sense of where beat one is. You always need to know where the one is because if you're on a gig, if you're in a rehearsal, whatever, you're playing with other musicians, chances are the drummer is not going to help you out. In fact, quite the opposite, they'll probably want to mess with you to test your time. So it's really important that you have a strong sense of where B1 is so you're not sort of hanging off the drummer's coattails the whole time. So we've put our pairs of eighth notes through their paces. We're going to talk now about eighth note rests, which are really the start of offbeat or syncopated rhythms. An eighth note rest, which looks like this, indicates half a beat of silence. This means that we're now able to explore a lot of rhythmic ideas that begin on the offbeat. And this is known as syncopated rhythm. Syncopation is the general term for anything that occurs not on a downbeat. And for me, that's really where all the rhythmic interest in music lies. Not a lot of interesting stuff happens on beat one. You might, dif you might disagree. Um, and it doesn't matter what style of music you're into, you know, funk, jazz, progressive rock, Tibetan throat singing, whatever you might be listening to, all you know, skilled practitioners in those genres of music make extensive use of eighth note syncopation to create rhythmic interest. If everything's always on the beat, it's very dull. So if we look at a bar of eighth notes, we can start to explore a bit of syncopation by placing an eighth note rest at the start of the bar and removing the note on beat one. So let's have a look at this. Again, we're going to be counting out our eighth note subdivision because we've got eighth notes all the time. We're going to be saying one and two and three and four. And the challenge now is to be able to count beat one but not play anything on it. Let's try that. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. If you try that on your own, sometimes it's harder than it looks. Right? It's surprisingly hard to do while you're counting, you're playing and counting the beats out loud and remembering to rest. So that might take a few attempts to get it really comfortable. Nothing wrong with that at all. Definitely took me a few attempts the first time I did it. So in order to become elite syncopators, I think that's a word. If not, I've just made it up and I like it. Syncopators. People who syncopate. In order to be elite syncopators, we need to be really comfortable with placing an eighth note rest anywhere in the bar. So that's what we're going to do now. Let's have a look at this next example. And you'll see that we're moving the eighth note rest from beat one to beat two to beat three to beat four. Now this might seem like a really simple exercise, but it's worth spending a bit of time on it and getting it really, really confident and accurate. And an important thing to note is if you're the sort of person that likes to tap your foot when you play, you need to make sure that your foot tapping is constant and is not affected by the rhythm that you're playing. Sometimes when we get into syncopated rhythms, we find that our feet tend to go with our hands and start doing all sorts of strange spasmodic foot taps. If that's the case for you, stick with this until you can separate these two things out and get them ind independent. Because if that's a problem, it's gonna hold you back when you get into more complicated syncopated rhythms. Anyway, enough waffling, let's play the thing. We're gonna go in at 60 beats a minute. I'm only gonna play this once, but I would definitely recommend practicing it several times at home just to get really, really confident and accurate with it. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Not to labour the point, but you'll notice that I'm trying to keep my eighth notes as long as possible. Very easy to get on the bass and play short, choppy notes and call it funk, but long notes are hard to do. And what we want to do is get in the habit of playing everything for its full written value. Otherwise, we're going to get into trouble further down the road. So let's put our newfound syncopation skills into practice with a few more short exercises. 
Again, because things are getting more complicated now, I recommend pausing the video once you can see the notation, having a go at it, and then when you're comfortable, hit play, and you can play along with it. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Let's do one more just to double check that we're happy with this. One, two, three, four. 